Well, this is it. I am rounding out my 49th birthday by doing a print from the past episode. I kind of went back and forth between opening up a brand new game and opening up a brand new magazine, and this particular magazine just made sense because it is an anniversary edition, much like today is an anniversary for myself, so I figured I would go ahead and open it up. We are going to open up the May 1996 edition of Electronic Gaming Monthly which is the 8th anniversary edition, and it is from May 96, which means that back in April of 1996 is when this hit store shelves. And as we see here, it looks like there is Virtual Fighter on the front, as well as Turok, William's Greatest Hits, which we just opened for Unsealed very recently, Die Hard Trilogy, and more. So this right here... We're going to go ahead and open up and see what is on the inside. I thank you very much for joining me for this episode, by the way. A very special episode as I am now 49 years old and an old, old man and now really on my way to 50. Let's go ahead and get this guy opened up, shall we? When we open this up, I believe we have something else on the inside too. So that will be pretty neat to get to once we get this open. There we go. So when we open this up, I've been sitting on this magazine for some time, so it is nice to be able to get this guy open. There we go, put this down here for now. So the first thing we have that I want to show you really quick before we get to the magazine is we have a Killer Instinct 2 strategy guide right here. Uh, this is very thin, it's only about 12 pages, 14 pages, 15 pages. Um, but yeah, you have all the move sets for all of the Killer Instinct characters, Killer Instinct 2 characters. Official, uncensored, unbiased is what this says here. If I'm being completely honest, although I really like the Killer Instinct games, I'm terrible at them. I never really understood the combo system, so I kind of played them a little bit in arcades, but honestly, I avoided them. Or, more often than not, I would just watch other people play. But this is a nice little addition. And then let's get to the main course, which is this issue right here. And when we open up the front of the magazine, we see ads for Coke and for Shell Shock. Back then, uh, in 96, I was still a Coke guy. I think I changed to Pepsi in the 2000s, uh, but I was still drinking a lot of Coke and Sprite back then. What else do we have here? We have an ad for P.O.D., which was originally a 3DO game and got ported to the Saturn and to the PlayStation. I have that, but I haven't played it. And then we have a bunch of pictures of staff from... baby pictures of staff from EGM here. Uh, Daniel Carpenter. Let's see if I recognize any other names. Andrew Barron is here. Howard Grossman. Uh, let's see, Terry Minich is here, Dave Richala is here, Jennifer Whitesides is here, Joe Fielder is here, uh, Shu, Dan Sue is here, uh, Sean Smith is here as well, so uh, nice to see all of these baby pictures uh, on the side there, that is a really cool addition, at least in my opinion it is. We have an ad for Slam and Jam 96, which is another 3DO conversion, this time for the Saturn and for the PlayStation. I actually opened up a brand new copy of Slam and Jam 96 for one of my first episodes of Unsealed uh, three years ago. Uh, so it's cool to see that. Uh, Slam and Jam 96 is very much like Run and Gun from Konami. It is the same style of play, um, almost like an NBA 2K type camera where it is end to end rather than side to side. Uh, a lot of high flying dunks, however, very arcade like in terms of gameplay, and I certainly welcome that, which is why it's a game I like to go to time and again. So that is a look at Slam and Jam 96. We have Project Overkill listed here, and I know it's kind of tough to see because I have the microphone here. Project Overkill for the PlayStation from Konami. And what else do we have here? Uh, I'm not going to go over the table of contents. It doesn't make a lot of sense. An ad for NBA Shootout. NBA Shootout being one of the last of the 
Sony first party sports games to come out. NBA Shootout never got to the same heights that NBA Live got to, um, but still, Sony made a, a decent effort, a decent attempt at getting NBA games on their system under their first party flagship. So uh, that's good to see. Milk the Clock. As Nintendo and Matsushita delays surface, much awaited 64 bit machines milk the clock. Talking still about the M2, which was still going to be a thing, which unfortunately was not. And of course, the Nintendo 64, which was still the Ultra 64, was going through its own set of delays. So if you wanted to play a new generation console, you were either getting a PlayStation or a Saturn. If you were myself, you were getting the PlayStation and kind of ignoring the Saturn, but nonetheless, you were playing. 32-bit, and that was it. Who do you pay to play? So here, we actually break down where a $70 cartridge goes. I'll take a bigger picture of this uh, for Instagram and Twitter, but it's pretty interesting when we look at that. And this is back in 96, mind you, so this obviously isn't holding up today. Uh, $18 to the retailer, dollar Distributor profit, $1.80 marketing cost, $6.20 shipping and distribution cost. So $9 for distribution, $18 for the retailer, $36 to the publisher, $10 license fee, a hardware license fee, so Nintendo would get that for their cartridges, $5 for other licensing fees like for sports leagues and things, $12 in components like memory chips, $2 for packaging, $4 for advertising, $3 in publisher profit. That was it. They would make $3 in profit per cartridge sold, at least according to this. And then $7 for developers, $1.05 developer profit per game, $1.75 computers and operating costs, and $4.20 programmer salaries and royalties. We've broken this down before, and I'm sure you've heard about it, talked about before, about how expensive it is to make a game, how expensive it is to sell a game, and yes, there are certainly a lot of expenses involved in that. It's kind of neat, or was kind of neat back then, to see where your $70 for a cartridge would go, and this would be super important because the Nintendo 64 would continue the cartridge strategy, breaking away from what the Saturn and the PlayStation were doing with CD-ROM, where there was a little bit less in terms of overhead in terms of the media. Buying the media was a lot easier or a lot less expensive than buying the memory chips and buying the cartridges themselves. So that's pretty interesting, I think. And again, I'll try and take a picture of that uh, for social media a bit later on. And they do the same thing for CDs right there. So we have the CD breakdown. And we take a look at that breakdown, $18 to the retailer, $9 for the distributor, $26 to the publisher, $4.40 of publisher profit per unit sold. That's not bad. Only $7 for the developer. Again, just a $1.05 in developer profit. So you'd have to sell, I mean, you sell a million, I guess you get a million dollars in profit, but million sellers back in 96, not quite as prevalent as we're seeing now because the base of video game consumers was not quite to the level that it is today. So that's pretty interesting. This is a really cool article and I'll try and share more information about it on social media a bit later as I don't want to take up the whole episode with just that. We also have an ad here for Die Hard Trilogy for the PlayStation. What a cool set of games that is, and I think they do some previews of that a bit later on. Let's see what we else we have here. An ad for Darkstalkers. Darkstalkers, the Street Fighter alike, but with different characters and set in a more horror-based setting. Um, I was never very good at the Darkstalkers games, I'm being completely honest. I tried to play them. I owned the original Darkstalkers and Darkstalkers 3 for the PlayStation, but my skill at those games, despite being a pretty good Street Fighter player, is slim and none. So that's kind of the way that goes. An ad here for Intelligent Gamer Magazine, as well as some coupons for Data East games. A $5 coupon for In the Hunt. In the Hunt is pretty expensive now. Uh, winning Post and Space Griffin VF9. So it was kind of cool to get coupons in these magazines if you were looking to buy some new games. So that is always nice. What else do we have here? It's pretty interesting. An ad for Zork Nemesis. Never played Zork Nemesis. 
Although Zork was one of the first computer games that I played, I absolutely sucked at it. I didn't know what I was doing. And there were not strategy guides back then, really, that were available. So it was very much kind of like a feeling out process. And then the review crew. and We've got reviews for Resident Evil for the PlayStation 8, a 9.5, a 9, and a 9. It was the game of the month. Um, Super Mario RPG also reviewed in this issue, 9.5, 9.0, 8.5, and an 8.0. I believe that's Sushi X with the 8.0. Let's see what Sushi X says. Besides being completely overused, I feel Mario should just take a vacation until the N64 gives him a new home. His latest RPG puts him in the same old role as a plumber hero with extraordinary skills. Mario RPG uses great in-combat graphics and continues Nintendo's tradition for clean animation and worthwhile visuals, however. But I do feel that the characters in the game base is just a bit too childish for the demanding play and difficult battles against the hordes of opposing forces. If you can overlook these childish tendencies, and again, this is a Nintendo thing back then, Nintendo was for kids. Unfortunately, we still have a little bit of that stigma today, but it was much worse back then. But if you can get over these childish tendencies, Mario RPG will satisfy the majority of players with the enjoyable combat system and the many twists and turns in the plot. Mario fanatics don't bypass this title. It could possibly be the last of the 16-bit RPGs. Also have a review of Marsupilami. I think I'm saying that right, Marsupilami. Uh, Iron Storm for the Saturn. Night Warriors for Capcom for the Saturn, which is a Darkstalkers game. <clears throat> Panzer Dragoon 2 for the Saturn gets an 8, 8.5, 8.5, and an 8. Worms for the Saturn. Magic Carpet for the PlayStation is a game I've kind of sort of had my eye on, but I've never played it. It was a game that I really wanted to play, and it's one of those long box titles, so if I wanted to get it, I'd be getting it in that way. But the reviews are kind of iffy. A 6.0, an 8.0, a 7.0, and a 7.0. Uh, a slightly puzzle-oriented shooter, says one of the reviewers here. So, mm, we'll see. What else do we have in store? Namco Arcade Classics for the PlayStation. So this is Namco Museum Volume 1, getting 8.5 and then 3 8 uh, Namco Museum Volume 1 is fantastic. Namco Museum Volume 3 is also very good. Um, finishing the Namco Museum series for the PlayStation gets very expensive, though. 2, 4, and 5, which are the lesser-selling titles, are increasingly more expensive to get, especially Volume 5, which is the one that I'm missing, which is well over $100 just for the loose disc now. So it's kind of crazy for that. Lucien's Quest for the 3DO and Arena for the Game Gear, uh, neither of those I really have uh, much familiarity with. Here's a rundown of the moves for Jellico's latest fighting game, Slam Dragon, released for the PlayStation in the coming months. I don't know anything about Slam Dragon. If you do in the comments, you can go ahead and leave them, but I, I honestly don't know anything about it myself. But Quarterman does give us a moves guide just for those who want it. And an ad for Williams Arcade's Greatest Hits, which we opened the jewel case version of that on Unsealed recently. Um, and this is the long box version here. And that is something I'm definitely looking for for my collection. An ad for Hardball 5 for the Saturn and for the PlayStation. Hardball 5 getting commentary from the one, the only Al Michaels. Uh, it is still very fragmented and broken. It is not smoothly, seamlessly put together like we would hear in other later sports games. But nonetheless, this is an early baseball game. And if you were a baseball fan, you probably gave this one at least a little bit of a look, if not a more uh, intense amount of thought as to whether you're going to buy it or not. We have Quarterman's Gossip, lower Saturn prices overseas, N64 delayed till Turkey Day. Not quite, but it's close. More info on the N64's bulky drive, which would be the 64 Double D. What's up with the PlayStation 2? We're already talking about the PS2 about a year after launch. No Killer Instinct on N64. Ah, 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 but they did get Killer Instinct Gold. Mortal Kombat 2 movie due in 97. That would mean Mortal Kombat Annihilation. 3D Jedi Knights game and more. Uh, these Quarterman columns are always fun to read. I'm not going to go through all of them in this episode, but I always do like to leaf through these and see exactly how accurate the rumor mill was back in the day. We also have an ad here for virtual eyeglasses. Yes, we are still trying to make virtual reality a thing in the mid-1990s. It was going to be the next best thing, except it was not the next best thing. 
And it is funny because even now in 2021, VR has always been pushed as the next big thing. And as of now, despite years of being pushed, it is not, at least not yet. We have our Tricks of the Trade, and we have an ad for Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 as well. Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3. Man, I, you know, Mortal Com- the Mortal Kombat 3 and Ultimate, I really wanted to be at least somewhat decent at those games, especially after really liking Mortal Kombat 2, but as is the case, I was not able to get the move sets down. I certainly wasn't able to memorize the fatalities, and the need to have a block button instead of holding back on the stick really held me back from any kind of skill with that particular game. We have passwords here for Mega Man X3, and we also have uh, some cheats here for College Slam for the Super Nintendo and for the Genesis. What else do we have here? Agile Warrior, College Slam, more codes this time for the 32-bit versions. Ridge Racer Revolution, a mini cars trick. In the shooter, so I believe that is Galaga or Galaxian, I think. Um, Oh, no, Galaga 88. So you have to hold L1, R1, triangle, select, and down simultaneously, and a a laser will destroy every ship. When you do that, you get the miniature cars. So that's pretty interesting. Batman Forever, the arcade game, is listed here on the sidebar. Another game I have the disc loose for the PlayStation, and that is pretty crazy expensive right now. What else we got going on here? More codes for Captain Quasar for the 3DO, In the Hunt for the PlayStation, Johnny Bazooka Tone for the PlayStation and 3DO, Mortal Kombat 2 for the Saturn, Uh, WrestleMania, the arcade game, Hi, my buddy Josh, if you're watching. Uh, WrestleMania, the arcade game for the PlayStation. And 3D Lemmings for the PlayStation as well. More ads for Night Warriors. Or what you can see of it anyway. What else we got going on here? Time Machine, the 8th anniversary special feature. So we look back at the history of EGM Magazine through its first eight years, and it walks us through the timeline, which I think is pretty gosh darn cool from the early issues all the way to the present, talking about Street Fighter 2, of course, and Street Fighter 2 and EGM are pretty much synonymous with each other. The amount of coverage that Street Fighter 2 got in EGM over the years was just crazy, including the April Fool's joke where they tried to say that Sheng Long was a hidden character in the game, and they had everybody fooled, and then everyone got mad when they found out they got trolled. Uh, it was definitely an interesting time for sure. There it is, as a matter of fact, the April Fool's joke you can see right there at the bottom. Uh, That is some funny, funny stuff. It seemed harmless at the time. Create an April Fool's joke so realistic you'd have the readers scratching their heads for days. Well, it happened, and boy, did it ever. The infamous Sheng Long trick printed in the April 1992 issue, EGM 33, received so much attention that the trick was even reprinted without permission in a Hong Kong comic. Paying closer attention to the Name of the submitter should have given the trick away. W.A. Stokens, which is basically Waste Tokens. Uh, Fold Again H.A., which is Fooled Again Ha. (laughs) The final kicker was that the fact we printed an April Fool's contest report directly underneath the trick. Only a few eagle-eyed readers caught on to that one. We could tell you exactly how we did that trick, but we would ruin the effect. Kind of like knowing Beavis and Butthead aren't real. Uh, I remember that. That was, man, people were just legit upset that that was not a real thing. Walking through 1991, walking through the release of the Super Nintendo, 1992, uh, Fabio on the cover and an X-Men cover as well. Uh, Oh my gosh. The eight rarest issues of EGM, EGM 7, 9, 11, 12. There are two covers for EGM 8, and then 33 and 41. So if you find any of those on eBay, um, snap them up if you can find them. And again, 1992 is the year of the Street Fighter, and there's even more stuff here. It's fun just to read through the history of the magazine. I bought EGM religiously every month from 1991 until maybe 2005 or the mid-2000s. Whenever it's 
I, I couldn't really find it, but it was just for years and years and years. Every month I would go out, I would buy a staple of video game magazines. I would buy EGM, I would buy GamePro, I would buy video games and computer entertainment or video games as it would wind up later being called. Uh, Game players, I would buy anything that was video game related that I could find that was new and maybe give me some more different information I was going to go ahead and spend money on. That was just the way it was. I've talked about the fact that I probably should have subscribed to some of these magazines, but I just never did, Uh, which is probably one of my regrets when I look back at my younger years now as an almost half a century old person. Uh, That's something I probably would have done differently. An ad for Skeleton Warriors here, as well as the end of the piece talking about like the mid-90s EGM, bringing us up to present, at least present day at that time. What else do we have? We have con- we have contests for Darkstalkers and War Gods arcades machines. So you can see those right there. We're about halfway done. This is a, uh, a springtime issue, so it's not going to be as heavy as your holiday issues would be. What else do we have going on? If you want to subscribe to EGM, you could send this in. Unfortunately, you can't really do that anymore, so I'm going to kind of put that to the side. The National Soul Edge Tournament, May 4th through June 1st. So we're already talking about Soul Edge, which would eventually be called Soul Blade for the PlayStation for the home conversion. Uh, prizes included a trip to Japan, Darkstalkers Arcade Machine, War Gods Arcade Machine, Area 51 Arcade Machine, Soul Edge Arcade Machine, Neo Geo CD System, which is pretty darn expensive, PlayStation, Mortal Kombat 3 games, King of Fighters 95 CD game, Darkstalkers games, Return Fire games, a a subscription to EGM, and a lot more. And you could put in your entries for any of these prizes. So that I think that was part of the 8th anniversary celebration for the magazine. An ad for College Slam. I want to talk about College Slam for just a minute since it is brought up in this magazine. College Slam was the first game from Acclaim that was original after they wound up getting the NBA Jam engine from Midway. Um, College Slam generally works okay. I think that's the closest to the Jam feel that Acclaim would get for a long time. The problem with using college instead of pro is that you're playing halves. So the halves have to be twice as long as your average quarter. And playing what feels like a quarter for six minutes when playing NBA Jam for six minutes at a time before getting a break is just a bit too long. They needed to break that up a bit more, um, and that's one of the reasons, in my opinion, why it didn't work. They did have some interesting ideas, like alley-oops, for example, which NBA Hangtime would implement a lot better when Midway went back and uh, Mark Trammell went back to the idea. But nevertheless, I think that College Slam kind of gets a little bit of a bad rap. It is certainly a lot better than NBA Jam Extreme, which was the attempt to bring NBA Jam into the 3D space, which was just absolutely terrible. That is my piece on College Slam. We have uh, a write-up here on Virtua Fighter 3. Now, Virtual Fighter is a series that I really don't know a lot about. I've played a little bit of it in arcades, and if I'm being completely honest, my experience with, uh, with Virtual Fighter... is thanks to this game right here, Virtua Fighter 4 Evolution, which is a game I'll get to on Unsealed at some point in the not-too-distant future. Um, I didn't play a lot of Virtua Fighter in the arcade because, to me, it was too technical. Uh, I was always used to the quarter-circle forward idea. I was very much a Capcom student, so playing any other school of fighting game, even if it was Tekken, for example, uh, was something that I struggled with getting used to and didn't adapt well to. So I always go back to what I was comfortable with, which would be Street Fighter 2 or Street Fighter 2 Turbo or Super Street Fighter or any of those. Um, But Virtual Fighter 3 is a gorgeous looking game for the time and still looks pretty good today. Although I think that Virtual Fighter 4 certainly tops it. What else? We have War Gods, Xevious 3DG, Gunblade New York, and NBA Jam Extreme. I just talked about NBA Jam Extreme. Uh, Xevious 3DG, we actually did get a home port for the PlayStation. Uh, I do have that. Uh, That is an interesting play, although I do find myself going back to the original 2D game more often than not. 
Gunblade New York, which is now a Wii game, which is stupid expensive, and War Gods, of course, which is kind of like, kind of sort of like a um, an experimental period in Midway's history, trying to get used to the 3D technology before Mortal Kombat 4 would be a thing. Prop Cycle, Jet Wave, and Alpine Surfer. We have those listed there. Dead or Alive, which would become a fighting game that was pretty prominent for console. Tokyo Wars, and of course, Soul Edge or Soul Blade, a game that was weapons-based, but still felt enough like Tekken where it was familiar and a lot of players enjoyed it. To me... Soul Blade kind of laid the foundation. Once we got the Soul Calibur for the Dreamcast and especially Soul Calibur 2 for the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube, that's when the series really hit its stride. That was the apex. That was the peak. After Soul Calibur 2, we kind of started to see that slow descent for the series, unfortunately. Uh, Soul Calibur 3 was a PS2 exclusive. It was kind of okay. Soul Calibur 4 was another multi-platform game. Looked great, but didn't have quite as much substance to it as earlier Soul Calibur games did. Soul Calibur 5 was just... I don't even want to talk about Soul Calibur 5 because I was so disappointed in that. And then Soul Calibur 6 for the Xbox One and the PS4 was pretty decent. It was a game that we probably didn't deserve to get because we didn't give enough attention to the earlier Soul Calibur games. So I'm glad it came out. Could it have been better? Sure, but I think it was pretty decent. Final Fantasy 7. So we're talking about FF7 in spring of 1996. I don't have to tell you how big a deal that Final Fantasy 7 was at the time and continues to be today. It was a very big deal. Because it was coming out for the PlayStation exclusively, that is what was selling PlayStation consoles. At first for the core fan, and then later, as advertising really hit home and everyone's like, oh, Final Fantasy, what's that? Then it was selling a lot of PlayStations at that time within the next, like, I don't know, six months before Final Fantasy VII really hit when the advertising was just wall-to-wall. When you advertise like that, when you're hitting the marketing that hard, people are going to be buying it because they're interested, they're hyped, they want to know what it is. And Final Fantasy VII, I believe, was certainly worth that hype. And look at Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3, which is for the Saturn, I believe. I've talked about Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 already, so I'm not going to stick on that for too long. We also have... Let's see. What do we have? Panzer Drag- Dragoon 2 is why. We have that right there for the Saturn as well. Panzer Dragoon is probably... This series, one of the series of games, one of the few series of games for the Saturn that really got a lot of attention then and gets even more now. We're looking into collecting for the Saturn or trying to find games for the Saturn. Panzer Dragoon games are pretty darn expensive. I also have an ad here, I'm sorry, for Bottom of the Ninth for the PlayStation, which I've talked about in the past. In fact, I opened up a brand new copy of Bottom of the Ninth 97 earlier this year. Return Fire, originally for the 3DO, but ported to the PlayStation, Saturn, and 3DO. I love Return Fire. I am not great at these kind of games. It's kind of a little bit of strategy, a little bit of action. But for me, what stands out about Return Fire is the music and the licensed, well, not licensed, but the classical soundtrack, like Flight of the Bumblebee and... uh, I'm trying to think. um, Flight of the Bumblebee is the one that sticks out. Uh, Flight of the Valkyries, I think, is another one that sticks out. The War of 1812, I think, is another one. Um, Being someone who's kind of sort of been into classical music, that really hit home for me when it had come out for the 3DO and then later for the PlayStation. Fox Hunt, another white whale of mine for the PlayStation, a game that I'm probably never going to be able to afford. It is a full motion video experience. Um... The closest I ever got to playing it was watching a replay video from some of the old Game Informer staff that I absolutely loved. Uh, I'd like to own this game at some point, but the price on it is just way too steep for a full motion video game. I just don't think that I can pay that kind of money. Just kind of leafing through Die Hard Trilogy for the PlayStation. 
Die Hard Trilogy, for those that don't know, is three games in one, and there are three different game types for the three movies. Uh, the original Die Hard is kind of like a uh, three-quarters view shooter of sorts, whereas Die Hard 2 is very much like Virtual Cop, which is my favorite game of the trilogy, and Die Hard... Three is a driving game. Uh, so three different kinds of games. They all look pretty good. They're all fun to play, and you can get that for the PlayStation uh, in a used capacity. And I don't think it costs too, too much, but PlayStation games these days have gone way up in price without me even noticing. I mean, heck, we're paying over $80 for Parasite Eve now, which is kind of crazy. Williams, arcade, uh, Williams Greatest Arcade Hits, which is really Williams Arcade's Greatest Hits. They have a little bit of a layout on that. And again, we did talk about that in Unsealed not too long ago. Between that and Namco Museum, we had our first experience with emulation for the PlayStation. And we would see more of these compilation discs in the years to come. We have Protos here for Bugs Bunny Double Trouble for the Genesis Crime Wave for the Saturn, Ganymede for the PlayStation. I don't know if that wound up being released, honestly. Um, what is that? Time Commando for the PlayStation and Supersonic for the Saturn. I'll show you what those look like just so you can see. Bear in mind that in 96, while some people were getting online, video game magazines were still our best way to find out about games that were coming out in the not-too-distant future. So seeing these screenshots were as close as we would get. So we kind of ogled over these things and were thirsty for more information if they caught our eye. A proto for Turok the Dinosaur Hunter for the Nintendo 64. And I don't know if you can see it. I'll try and make it bigger, but you can see the Nintendo 64 logo. They've they've replaced the Ultra 64 logo at this point. It looks like Ultra 64, but they replaced the word Ultra with the word Nintendo. A game called Tomb Raiders, which would eventually be called Tomb Raider. Uh, and you can see what Lara Croft looks like early on. Uh, that is definitely an interesting look for Lara. Virtua Fighter for the Game Gear. Really? Okay. And Rocket Jockey for the PlayStation. An ad for VR Sports where we have VR Soccer 96. I'm more of a fan of VR Golf 97, but that's just me. I believe there was a VR Baseball as well, if I'm not mistaken. Team EGM, which is the sports section. We have a look at NBA Shootout, which would release in April of 96, according to the magazine here. Uh, again, with NBA Shootout, it tries. It really does try to compete, but I think that EA was always a step ahead of Sony's internal development studios when it came to basketball. If I remember right, uh, these were developed by Sony Computer Entertainment of Europe, so that's already kind of a step behind um, because I don't know how much the European developers really had a handle on basketball. And one of the things about shootout that I always hated was that you couldn't change the button assignments around. So shooting was always something that I couldn't get used to after playing other basketball games. NBA Live 96 would be the competition there. We also have MVP Baseball, which was from Data East, not from anyone else. NBA Action for the Saturn is listed here as well, so you can see those. NBA Live 96 was very much like a Genesis game for the PlayStation, had similar visuals, which you could kind of take or leave. It was definitely a transitional year, but NBA Live 97 would start to change that around pretty quickly. Ken Griffey Jr.'s winning run for the Super Nintendo, a game that I think deserves a bit more respect, but that's just me. Dream Team from U.S. Gold for the PlayStation, a game that I don't believe wound up being a thing. I believe that wound up getting the rug pulled out from under it. So we still only wound up getting one dedicated Team USA basketball game, and that was from EA for the Genesis during the early 1990s. Some review scores. The port of Need for Speed for the PlayStation wound up getting a 9 and an 8.5. College Slam got a 6 and a 5.5. I've already said my piece on College Slam. I really need to stop talking about that game. NHL Power Play for the Saturn getting a 7.5 and, and an 8.5. And, and Ken Griffey Jr.'s winning run getting a pair of 8s. 
And then finally, we have some letters to the editor. I have heard some good things about an old Sega Genesis game called Herzog's Y. I'm trying to locate it, but more importantly, I'm trying to find some old reviews, but my mags only date back to 1992. What can you tell me about this classic title? Asks Rob from New Hyde Park, New York. Well, it looks like you started reading EGM a bit too late. EGM reviewed Herzog's Vi in issue 10 in 1990. For reasons unbeknownst to me, since I love the game, the review crew really bashed it, giving it scores of 4, 6, 4, and 3. If you're into military action games like Military Madness for the TurboGrafx-16 or Earthlight for the Super Famicom, this game is definitely hot. So that's kind of neat to see. What else we got? What is going to happen to the people who bought the old Sega Saturn if the 2.0 version is coming out? Isn't it unfair for the people who bought the older version of the Saturn? Are they going to do the same thing they did with the infamous 32X and trash the older version? Does the Saturn have glitches and they are going to be fixed the 2.0 version? The answer is, the Saturn 2.0 will be 100% compatible with the original Saturn. The release of the 2.0 for now will only be in Japan. No word on if it will be released in the US, but watch Sega announce it at the E3. The whole point of version 2.0 is for the price wars between all of the next generation systems. The Saturn does not have any glitches or bugs in the operating system. The only difference between the original and Saturn 2.0 is the look of the system. The actual architecture of the electronic components and the operating system will remain untouched in the reconfiguration of Sega's 32-bit system. And that is a look at this particular issue of EGM. Last, of course, but not least... We do have an ad for Resident Evil, the very first one, the game that started it all for Capcom in terms of survival horror. And that is a look back at the May 1996 issue of Electronic Gaming Monthly, which is number 82. It is 10 minutes before midnight, so I have 10 minutes left on my birthday. I want to thank everyone on social media who did take the time out of their busy schedules today to wish me a happy birthday. I'm now 49, and I'm counting my way to the big 5-0. We'll see if I get there and what kind of condition I'm in next April 22nd. As always, I thank you very much for taking the time to watch this episode of Print from the Past. I hope that you enjoyed it and maybe got some memories of the mid-90s. Take care of yourselves, and until the next time, my friends, I will see you later.